Ok. So, hello, good morning, good evening, and welcome to this very special webinar by Earth Journalism Network on learning about zoonotic diseases and how to cover them. I'm Stella Paul, Environment and Health Project Officer at EJN and your moderator for the day. We have today a brilliant lineup of speakers with us. But before I go to uh, introducing them to you, uh, let me touch upon a few logistical details here. Our webinar is expected to be about an hour today. And we do want it as interacting, uh, interactive as possible. So we, we encourage you to post your questions. You can do this throughout the webinar. And uh, to post questions, please use the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also use uh, chat, but do remember this is only for talking to a fellow attendee, a fellow journalist. Uh, to, to post the questions, you must use the Q&A button. Uh, if your question is for a specific uh, panelist today, uh, do mention that. Uh, we will have a special Q&A uh, session at the end, but we will also be always keeping an eye on the questions that you are posting. So with that, uh, let me now introduce our panelists today. Uh, first on my screen, I see Dennis Carroll. Uh, Dennis is a senior scientist and chair of leadership board at Global Biome Project. Uh, Dennis, we, have, we are very, very excited to have you here. We have lots of questions for you, I'm sure, but uh, I'll come back to you in a minute uh, with the first one that uh, is on top of uh, the hat for many of us. Our next uh, panelist today is Robert Kessler. Uh, Robert is uh, the communications manager at EcoHealth Alliance. He is also a former journalist and somebody who understands media and the needs of journalists uh, very, very well. So we are going to uh, be taking some, some advantage of that and uh, be listening to you know, what Robert has to you know, share with us today. Uh, we have our next uh, panelist is Amy Sim, uh, the Asia Manager of Internews EJN. And Amy will be here launching today the zoonotic online course that EJN has designed for journalists. And um, last but not least, we have James Fan, the executive. Uh, the director of, of EJN, uh, sorry, the, I, I, the executive director just, just comes <laughs> to mind when we, we, we interact too much with this, uh, the, the UN diplomats. But yeah, James is our director of EJN and many of you may have already know him. Uh, today, James is uh, here mostly to observe and listen, but yes, he. Uh, he, he may ask a question or two to the panelist, you know. So with the introduction done, uh, let us now start with our, you know, with our questions. First, I would like to start with you, Dennis. Uh, we have just seen WHO has made public its report on the origin of COVID-19 and many journalists across the world are really curious to know what has been found, what do we know, where do we go from here, and also what are the things that a journalist must know at this point to cover zoonotic diseases. So over to you, Dennis. Great. First off, uh, Stella, thank you. Um, and to uh, my fellow panelists, it's a uh, a privilege uh, to be able to share this space with you and to all of those who are watching. Uh, I hope you are well and I hope your family uh, is doing well. Uh, the question about the WHO report, 
first and foremost, we need to ask ourselves, why do we need such a report? And the answer is understanding where this virus came from, understanding its origins is key to helping us understand how we can better prepare and prevent against future um, threats like this. So having a clear understanding uh, whether this was a natural zoonotic disease emergence or whether a laboratory accident was involved. Either way, we need to understand because if we're gonna be better prepared in the beginning for the next one, to be informed is to be forewarned. And in that case, the WHO sent out a team uh, to help us understand in fact, what was its origins? We know that in December of 2019, we began getting the first signals that there was an unusual uh, public health event uh, that within a few weeks, we began to understand it was a new novel virus, the coronavirus that is now um, very much part of our landscape around the world. The team went out there and was there for about a month. Um, Unfortunately, when the report came out, you know, good reports provide more answers than questions. And unfortunately, this was a report that left more questions than answers. And that is unfortunate. Uh, it's clear that there still is not clarity as to the origins of this virus. There is more work to be done. Um, the real unfortunate aspect of this though is how COVID-19 has become so politicized that it has made getting to the bottom of this mystery that much more challenging. So there's more work to be done. It's important to recognize that the Director General for WHO, Dr. Tedros, has committed himself to ensuring WHO will re-engage with China to um, provide more transparency and openness uh, in an ongoing process. We hope that is true. Uh, we hope that we can get the kind of access to data and information. Um, it is something that will benefit the people of China. It's something that will benefit the people of the world. So right now, I think it's enough to say that uh, this report left more questions than answers. Um, but again, it's critical that we understand the origins of this virus if we're ever going to be better prepared for the next one. I'll pause there. Stella, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the what I heard from you is that this report is anything but conclusive. And it is there are, anything it, but conclusive, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we would next go to Robert, but I would be back soon to you, Dennis, uh, for for more, you know, uh, to, to, for more more on zoonotic diseases. Um, Dennis, you have been you have been wearing many hats, the journalist and now communications expert. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that you do know, you deal with journalists every day, you do know uh, the needs and the constraints and also probably uh, the kind of stories that should be there but are not being done yet uh, for different reasons. So keeping all of that uh, in mind, what would you share with us today on zoonotic diseases uh, and, and how to cover them? Uh, yeah, I mean, big question there. But um, I think sort of one of the takeaways uh, that I'd like to leave you all with, um, if I could, is that the threat of emerging disease is, is not to overstate things, but sort of an existential threat to humanity. And, and what that really means is that it touches all areas of life. And, and there's stories to be mined in all sorts of places about zoonotic disease. So when it comes to the drivers of emerging disease, as Dennis mentioned, the politicization of this issue, 
these stories can be told throughout your newspapers, verticals, wherever it is that you're working in different sections. There are business stories, there are politics stories, there are international stories, there are local stories. And um, my hope is that people don't feel that they need to be writing about these sorts of things within one section only because the threat here really does touch every single part of our lives. We've, for the most part, been locked in our homes for the past year. And, and I can't think of anything in my life that's impacted day-to-day -day existence quite so much as COVID-19. And, and that outsized impact reflects the, the ways in which we can engage with the threat of, of zoonotic disease. It doesn't have to be just a science story. Um, and, and if that's not something that you're either interested in covering or if you're looking for something new, there are plenty of, of opportunities to do so. The, the world of emerging disease is somewhat small. And when I say that, I mean the people working on these issues uh, most know each other. And, and so if sort of my first piece of guidance would be if, I, if I'm looking to tell X and Y and Z story, I would reach out to somebody and say, I wanna tell a story you know, I'm a journalist based in Thailand and I wanna tell a story about local scientists who are working in Thailand. I'm not sure where to get started. Uh, you know, EcoHealth Alliance, the, the organization I work with, we've worked in Thailand before, we've worked with local teams in Thailand. I can guarantee you that, that Dennis has, knows people who, who work on this issue in Thailand as well. And that's just one example, but um, reach out to people and, and find, people who are, are, are working on these issues and, and just ask them because most people are, this is very hard work. Um, there's also not a lot of funding to do this work. And so there are, there are easier things to do. Most people working on the issue of emerging disease are doing so because they feel very passionate about this issue and, and are more than happy to share that passion with, with reporters and, and help them sort of get to you know, where they're going I, I sit some semi, semi frequently these days on fact checks with reporters and usually they're very apologetic about the time it requires to do a fact check and, and the thing that I tell everybody is the stories that a reporter sat down to fact check with me are always better than the ones that weren't um, and that simply is my job so whether or not it's inconvenient um, sort of is a moot point when it comes to getting the story right and making sure that, that the, the, the issues are out there and reported on correctly and, and you know, in a measured way. Um, I know I've given you all sort of just kind of a word salad of things to think about, but hopefully somewhere in there you've got an answer that, that uh, rings a bit true for, for your individual experience. Yeah, definitely, <clears throat> Robert, I think one thing that you you really hit the nail uh, here with uh, your your comment on you know it doesn't have to be a science story all the time, and I would be back to you on this like what are the other kind of stories that our journalists could you know cover um, at, at this point what we are seeing is that a second wave has just exploded, uh, you know, in, in some places, mostly in South Asia. Uh, and journalists are, are, are just talking to doctors at this point, uh, and not just at this point, for, for quite some time, mostly because they don't know who else to go to. They don't know who, who else can give them the information they need on, on whether it's COVID, whether it's any other zoonotic diseases. diseases. So, uh, and obviously there is also, uh, I think, lack of clarity on what kind of stories that they could actually do from, from which angle. So I'm pretty sure you have, you know, you could, you could really help share uh, some, some ideas on this. Uh, but uh, before I come back to you again, uh, let us go to our third panelist, uh, Amy, Amy Sim. Um, Amy, I would just give the floor to you. Take it from here. Thank you, Stella. Um, yeah, I'm very, very honored to take some time um, from this panel of very distinguished and respected experts here um, to introduce and launch our Earth Journalism Network first online course. Um, let me just uh, show you how it looks like. I'm just going to share my screen here. I hope you can see. 
Yeah, so this first online course is called uh, From Animals to Humans, How to Report on Zoonotic Diseases and Their Environmental Origins. Um, it's the first online course that um, EJN uh, has created. Um, we first had this idea at the beginning of uh, the, the COVID outbreak, um, when there was, uh, there was a lot of interest um, in COVID, obviously, and how uh, generally viruses uh, jump from um, animals to humans, and what are some of the factors contributing to the spillover. Um, so I think, uh, you know, a lot of journalists, no matter what beats they covered, um, you know, wanted to, to get up-to-date information and knowledge on, on zoonotic diseases, and that's why we uh, created this course. Um, and through this course, um, you will learn about the basic public health um, and epi epidemiology concepts, the basics of zoonotic diseases, um, some medical science and history, um, examples of such uh, zoonotic diseases and why, why they emerge and re-emerge and spread, um, and how this is linked to you know, population growth, to climate change, um, wildlife trade, and uh, general environmental degradation, and uh, how journalists can think about different ideas um, to, to produce good reports on zoonotic diseases, like what Robert mentioned, um, looking at this, uh, this topic from different angles, and uh, where to look for data sets um, to develop these stories. Um, in every lesson, um, there is a video, there's a summary text, um, and you can download the tr transcripts and the slides and there'll be a short quiz um, at the end of every lesson to gauge your understanding. Um, the content is largely drawn from um, the experts who came to our webinars to, to speak. Um, and at the end of uh, the curriculum, there is a, a final assessment um, to gauge your understanding. And if you uh, pass the assessment, you'll get an e-certificate that will be uh, emailed uh, to you. Um, as this is our, 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 our first uh, course, we also created a Slack channel um, for uh, users to send their feedback and also just as a platform for users to share and discuss, you know, share ideas, story ideas and discuss and ask questions um, with their peers and also with our staff. And uh, to go with this core curriculum, we've also developed a complementary um, tutorial uh, looking at more specifically using data uh, to investigate zoonotic diseases. So this is more like a tutorial um, to guide journalists on um, how they can use data to tell stories. Um, and uh, we have journalists on video sharing uh, their experience of developing data stories and often it's first using uh, a store, uh, posing a question as a starting point. There is also a data recipe that uh, we have developed, uh, which provides a step-by-step -step guide on how to produce a data story that investigates deforestation, which is one of the, uh, one of the main contributing uh, factors to the aware of viruses. Um, there are also some ideas for data sources for investigating zoonotic diseases. Um, and all of this is free. Um, we really hope you will um, try it out and let us know if this is useful for you. Um, I put on the link here um, and you can also find this link on our website and I believe uh, my colleague has pasted, yeah, it's in the chat as well. Um, please do go and check it out. Thank you. Wow. So, Amy, it seems this is uh, n not just a course for journalists covering health, but also journalists covering uh, environment, biodiversity, and, and, and a host of other issues as well. And, and how long is this, uh, this course? Um, good question. Um, <laughs> it's an introductory course, so it's not uh, overly long. Um, we really want to get the core concepts out. Um, it depends how much time you spend a day to do the course. Um, you know, uh, if, if you spend the whole day doing it, I think you can actually complete it in a day. But uh, each module is about 45 minutes long um, and we have about five modules. Um, yeah, so, you know, you can do it uh, in a couple of days. 
Okay. Okay. Sounds that's, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, and we're really looking at this uh, topic from a more one health uh, perspective. So we are looking, you know, um, to link up zoonotic you know, looking at the linkages of zoonotic diseases and um, you know environmental uh, factors. Um, and, and also, you know, the data tutorial also talks about, you know, other other uh, things, other other themes that journalists can can explore, like um, inequality, for example. Yep. Okay, I'm I'm pretty sure, especially the data recipe, that would be very helpful to a lot of journalists who are, you know, covering uh, data journalism, or doing data journalism, and especially looking at you know, planning to do some data rich stories on zoonotic diseases, but not getting a lot of, you know, uh, resources on this at this point. Now, with that, uh, I would now uh, come back to you, Dennis. Uh, but before that, let me again uh, ask the participants uh, to post your questions uh, using the Q&A button. And Dennis, uh, we actually have a question here uh, and meant for you. So this is, what will it take to be better prepared for the inevitable next pandemic? And have we learned anything from COVID-19? And with this also, Dennis, if you, if you can uh, share some takeaway messages uh, for our journalists today, that would be very helpful. So over to you. Uh, you are muted, Dennis. Stella, yeah. thank you. And to whoever sent that uh, question out, it's a great one. Let me, as a way of answering that question, I'm gonna put up a little uh, presentation about lessons that we have learned. Uh, Well, it's, well, I'm sorry. I am having um, let me just move out of this for a moment. Why don't you, I'm having a technical difficulty here. Uh, the slide that I had. Okay. Early okay. No, no problem. So while you get this you know, all sorted, we'll, we'll go to Robert. So Robert, you gave us a great uh, comment earlier saying that, you know, every zoonotic disease uh, story doesn't have to be a science story. And then you also talked about Echo Health Alliance, which obviously has a huge pool of, you know, experts uh, in, in different uh, regions across the world. Um, so uh, okay. could, you, could you tell us, Robert, uh, what are the stories that, you know, if not a science story, what are the stories that could be done by journalists? What stories that are still not there, you know? Uh, and, and yeah, and, and how could, if, if somebody wants to reach Echo Health Alliance, exactly how could they, could they do that? And, and, and how could, you know, what kind of resources, how could they expect from, from you or from Echo Health? Alliance here? Sure. I mean, the easiest part of that to answer is if you want to reach Eco Alliance, my cell phone is on our website, um, <laughs> as is my email address. I think you'll find that almost any communications manager has all of their information posted on their organization's website. Every single press release we put out has my desk phone, my cell phone, and my email address. They're really, I could not be, I'm always sort of amused when people, uh, say that I'm difficult to find. I'm probably the easiest person to reach in the entire world. Um, I think that's just sort of standard standard procedure, but Eagle of Alliance works, um, like you mentioned, around the world uh, in regions where we call them hotspot regions. So regions where the threat of emerging disease is greatest, so whether that means that there's a large diversity of viruses in wildlife, or um, sort of large amounts of acti human activity that lead to disease spillover. Uh, those are things like deforestation, other land use change like urbanization, um, wildlife trade, intensive agricultural production, 
um, and extractive industries as, as well have a, a negative impact on not only in the environment, but the reason for those things is, uh, and Dennis will speak to this here when we get him back, but most viruses in wild animals, their reservoirs, they do not harm the reservoir animal. The animal is not aware that they have them and they've probably been in those animals. They've co-evolved with those animals for thousands if not more years. And so when left alone, those viruses will continue to sort of circulate in those wildlife populations causing relatively no harm. But when humans go in and disrupt the natural order of things, the order that's been sort of created through hundreds of thousands, millions of years of evolution, we, we upset that balance and, and that's when bad things start to happen. So for instance, um, Nipah virus, which is a, is a really nasty encephalitis that um, has a mortality rate, I think of between 80 and 95%. It's a really, really, really bad disease. Uh, its first spillover was in Malaysia, and the reason that it spilled over was you had these massive pig farms, and on the exterior of the pig farms, those farmers were growing uh, mango orchards for additional income. Uh, fruit bats obviously are seeking out fruit to eat on, so when you create a mango orchard, you've created a, a, a great source of food for those bats. So bats would come in and feed on those mangoes at night, the mangoes that have been partially eaten are no longer saleable to humans. And so those mangoes were fed to the pigs. The pigs were then consuming mangoes that had bat urine, bat saliva on them. Those pigs contracted Nipah virus from bats, which are the reservoir host for that virus in particular. And then abattoir workers started coming down with this sickness that was, that was causing illness in their pigs and that was Nipah virus. So, what happened there was we had created a means for, for bats, pigs, and humans to come into contact that otherwise would not be the case. And, and the result of that was an outbreak of disease. And, and this is what we see with most disease outbreaks is really the, the cause, so to speak, comes down to something that we are doing to disrupt the natural order of our planet. And, and that's really what one of the focuses of One Health, which is a term that Amy used, One Health is, is really the guiding philosophy of our work at EGOLF Alliance. And that's understanding the connections between the health of animals, of humans, and of the environment. Like I said, we've, we've all co-evolved together and have created sort of a natural balance. And, and a lot of our human activity goes in and upsets that natural balance. And there are negative consequences to that. And we have to be aware of that and we have to be careful about that. Um, on the other side of the spectrum here, often halting these activities altogether is, is also not realistic at all. People rely on these industries for their income, for food security. And so the answer here is not to simply go back to a hunter-gatherer way of living, but we need to be aware of the, of the impact that we have. And we have to sort of be able to run you know, risk analysis and figure out what is and is not worth risk. For instance, fragmented forest is something that can be particularly dangerous when it comes to disease outbreaks. What that, what I mean by that is if you take a, a if you have a large amount of pristine forest and you tear down some of it, what you have right there at the edge of that forest is a good outgrowth of plants and that can can be a good place for interaction between humans and those animals. Um, and so if you're tearing down forest for a farm or plantations, something of that nature, if you take some here, some here, some there, you're creating a lot more fragmented forest than if you do so in a more well thought out manner. Um, a really good example on this one is Lyme disease, which uh, was essentially made a problem by the invention of the suburbs in America in the 1950s. So you're taking naturally forested area, you're building these large homes sort of outside of the city on that forest. And at the edge of the home property, what you have is you know a forest backing up right up to it. And the, the growth at the edge of that forest is the type of 
plant life that deer feeds on, those deer feed on, and deer carry the ticks that, that spread Lyme disease. And so really that's kind of how the suburbs invented Lyme disease, if you will. Um, so these are, these are all sort of, again, prohibition uh, is, is often not an effective solution to any problem. And so I caution with what I've all said that halting most activity together is, is not gonna help anybody more than it does hurt them. Um, but this is what organizations like Eco Health Alliance are working on is to understand where the risk is and also how to mitigate that risk, how to be prepared in the event that spillover happens. Um, and so I've got you know, some more thoughts prepared on this, but I'd love to, to flip it back to Dennis, who's got a presentation for you all that really does yeah. lay out um, a lot of the issues here when it comes to COVID-19 specifically in a, in a way that, that I myself would not be uh, as effective at communicating. Thank you, Robert. No, we really did hear some, some very interesting uh, things here, especially, you know, kind of um, picking the brain on habitat loss and, and, and uh, you know, wildlife uh, trade and several other drivers. And I'm sure those, the journalists who have uh, you know, uh, who are here today with us, they will be going back uh, with some very good ideas of how, how to do, you know, a uh, new range of stories, you know, from, from different perspective on different uh, issues. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. And, and let's move back to Dennis. I hope your, <laughs> your share screen is now, now sorted. Uh, we do have uh, a few questions for you, Dennis, but but uh, including one from, from James as well. Uh, so, but first, would you like to take the question that I asked you received earlier? And that was, you know, what will it take to be better prepared? You know, how can we be better prepared for the next pandemic? And what did we learn from COVID-19? Uh, you, you have to unmute yourself. Stella, again, thank you. And again, thank you to uh, the participant for that question. And my apologies, there was the inevitable uh, tech uh, glitch that I ran into. Let me throw up a uh, slide that I prepared, which I think uh, answers in part that question. Um, because one of the important things to understand is that every pandemic, every epidemic, every outbreak uh, in principle is a learning moment. It's a chance where we have an opportunity through the experience of that pandemic. And let's, let's think about, uh, here we are 20 years into the 21st century and we've already been experiencing SARS, avian influenza, the H1N1 pandemic of 2009, Ebola of 2014, MERS of 2013, and we Zika of 2016, and now we have the uh, coronavirus, the COVID-19 pandemic. Each one of those are experiences that we have an opportunity to draw lessons from. And what I would like to do in the next few minutes is just talk about four take-home lessons that really have been at the core of the COVID-19 pandemic. The first, of course, is a threat anywhere, is a threat everywhere. This is not an idle statement. You know, COVID-19, we first heard about in Wuhan, China. Very few people in the world had Wuhan, China on their map. Um, today, it is on everyone's map because an event that began in that very distant uh, part of the world, certainly distant with respect to where I sit, and I sit in Washington, D.C., we are now globally dealing with a consequence of what began in Wuhan. And when we think about a threat anywhere uh, as a threat everywhere, we also need to understand, and this is really the core take-home lesson, that you can't respond to a global threat such as COVID-19 through individual country actions. It requires a coordinated global response. 
And sadly, we have not seen that coordinated global response, either in terms of responding to the early um, spread of this virus in January, February, March of 2020, nor are we seeing a coordinated global response in terms of the distribution and availability of vaccines. And we need to understand that if we don't solve the problem everywhere, then no place is safe. And we can't solve a global problem without a global coordinated action. So that is the first take home message. Global threats require global actions. And we need to understand that our response to COVID-19 has been too country centric, too fragmented. And we need to, as part of preparing for the next one, make sure that we have a much better understanding and appreciation of how we can mobilize the whole of the planet in response to a planetary threat. My second uh, take home message is that COVID-19 is not a black swan event. And by that, I mean, you will hear people frequently say, COVID-19 is a one in a hundred year event. The last big pandemic we had, they will say, was in 1918. Well, the truth of the matter is we live in a different world. In 1918, that pandemic was a one in a hundred event. But today, because we live in a very different world and that very different world is really a consequence of the extraordinary changes in population on this planet. In 1918, there were 1.8 billion people. In 2020, we have 7.8 billion people. That increase of 6 billion people around the world has really contributed to the very kind of issues that Robert was talking about just a few moments ago. The intensification of agriculture, the expansion of settlements, all of that has become incredibly disruptive on the ecosystems around us. As we move to shelter and feed 6 billion more people, ensure there's adequate energy for 6 billion more people, those once in a hundred year events are now becoming far more frequent. So in fact, we really need, need to appreciate that in the 20th century, this is in fact the third pandemic potential event that we've had. SARS in 2003, H1N1 of 2009, and COVID-19 of 2019, 2020. And let's also be clear, that this is not what we would refer to as the big one. This COVID-19 pandemic, while it is devastating both our health and our economies and our societies, is not the kind of pandemic that we envision when we think about 1918. This is only a tenth as lethal as the virus that circulated in 1918. So it's important that we understand that COVID-19 is not an outlier. We will sooner than later be dealing with another COVID threat, another influenza threat, another Nipah-like threat, as Robert was talking about earlier, another Ebola-like threat. They're becoming more and more part of our landscape and they are very much part of the 21st century. So as we think about what we need to do to prepare, preparing for a threat like COVID-19 is not preparing for the one in a hundred year. It's preparing for something that could happen tomorrow, next year, three years from now. This is very much part of the norm for the 21st century. We live in a different world than our grandparents, and we need to appreciate that. The third take home message is that even as we think about the next pandemic or epidemic event, 
the virus that will drive that already exists. And Robert again talked about this when he referenced the Nipah virus circulating in fruit bats. Every virus that will plague us in the years to come, the very same as the COVID-19 virus, pre-exists in nature. They're circulating in wildlife, in bats, in rodents, in non-human primates. They exist and under, un, understanding that, the fact that we know that all future threats are already in existence gives us an enormous amount of opportunity to better prepare if we understood what those viruses were. And one of the really important take home messages is that we have not exploited our appreciation that these viruses are currently circulating and can be identified and understood today. We have an opportunity to go to the viruses in their natural habitat before they come to us and use that knowledge to better prepare, to prevent, and develop the kind of biomedical technologies that will make sure we never have another COVID-19 event again. But it requires that we have surveillance systems that aren't simply looking in human populations for the next threat, we need to expand our surveillance very much along the lines of what Amy was talking about moments ago, a One Health approach that our surveillance systems need to be inclusive of monitoring viruses circulating in people, but also in animals and using that forward leaning surveillance capability to understand risk before it emerges and use that insight to prevent and ensure we never have a COVID-19 event again. All of these future epidemics and pandemics are preventable, but it requires that we exploit our ability to understand where these threats are today and use that information in a thoughtful, aggressive way. And my last point is that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. This was offered up uh, two centuries ago as in a thought from an American statesman and scientist, Benjamin Franklin. And it stands tr as true today as it did then. When we think about the COVID-19 virus and its impact, we understand not only is it having a devastating impact on the populations of the people in terms of health, three million people have died already. But we also see the economic costs are in now accelerating well into the trillions of US dollars. And we see a societal disruption with over a year now of closures and um, personal restrictions having created tensions within societies everywhere. The consequence of waiting for an event and reacting to it leaves us vulnerable into the future for a repeating of what we've seen with COVID-19. The ounce of prevention is in this case about investing in the kind of systems and capabilities that will give us insight into future risk before those risks emerge. Again, I go back to the importance of having a global early warning surveillance system that is inherently multi-sectoral, monitoring wildlife and livestock and people, and making those investments so that we have better capabilities to prevent future threats from ever happening again. And let's think about the economics here. As I've said, we already know the cost of a pandemic are in trillions of dollars, millions of lives and societies irreparably disrupted. The cost of an early warning system, we already know what that cost is. Globally, it's 100 million US dollars a year. The price, 100 million US dollars for preventing the loss of the kinds of lives we've seen for COVID-19, for preventing the trillions of dollars lost 
economically and for protecting our societies against the worst um, possible consequences of disruption and disarray. An ounce of prevention is truly better than a pound of cure. So those are four take home messages as journalists understanding that we live in a global community and we can't look at an event in one part of the world and think it means nothing to us in another part of the world. That we need to understand we live in a world where these threats are not black swan events. They are the events which are part of our natural landscape. And when we talk about preparing, we're preparing for what may happen tomorrow. What not is what's gonna happen a hundred years from now. We need to prepare for tomorrow's next epidemic and pandemic. And we need to exploit our awareness that these viruses already exist. Let me remind you what Sun Tzu the Chinese diplomat, philosopher, and warrior said over 2,000 years ago, which is, if you know your enemy, you will be victorious in every battle. If you do not know your enemy, you will lose every battle. Think in this case of your enemy as the virus. And here we have a chance to know the virus, but we don't. And we see the consequences of not having been forewarned about this virus in advance. We can be victorious, but it requires that we invest in the prevention to prevent the kind of consequences that we've seen with COVID-19. So there are lessons. I hope in this case, these are lessons learned, these are lessons embraced, and they will become part of the way we invest in the future. Journalists can be very instrumental in ensuring that the populations of the world understand these lessons and that the politicians of the world embrace them and make the kind of investments that make the world safer for all. Thank you very much. I'll stop right there. Thank you, Dennis. That was, that was really wonderful. Um, I know you were you were a scientist. You, you you were focused on the science side of it, but I think for journalists who also cover health and zoonotic diseases, uh, you know, or politics, for example, uh, can go back today with with a lot of uh, ideas to think about. Uh, you know, uh, uh, some some things that I picked up from your your core messages is also. Uh, the, the need of, you know, global multi-sectoral coordination. I think the three words that I really picked up was, you know, the, the need of coordination, greater cooperation, and the need for an early warning, multi-sectoral early warning system. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm guessing that, you know, we will also need uh, some amount of science diplomacy now to play here across the world, probably. Um, now with that, I, we, we really have other questions for you, uh, our panelists, but I would like to bring in, you know, at this point, ask James, who has been sitting very patiently here today. And James, do you have any question for, for Denise or Robert or anybody? Yes, thank you, Stella. And thanks very much to the panelists. This has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, I want to circle back to the World Health Organization report that came out of China and um, what uh, uh, one of the members, Peter Daszak of EcoHealth Alliance, he's a disease ecologist who works with Robert, um, he told National Public Radio that the most likely source of the COVID-19 pandemic was wildlife farms in southern China. And he noted that the China shut down those wildlife farms back in February of 2020. And he says the WHO team found new evidence that these wildlife farms were supplying vendors at the Huanan seafood wholesale market in Wuhan with animals. So I'd like to ask Dennis, does he find this uh, persuasive? And what does he have any reflections on that? Does it give us any lessons for, for future uh, surveillance and prevention. And also ask Robert and Amy, that if, if, you know, what does this 
uh, imply potentially for journalists trying to cover issues related to zoonotic diseases? And what, what does it mean that, does it give us some, some sense of wh where we should be directing some of our coverage? Thank you. Great, uh, James, thank you for that question. Uh, let me first off say that, again, we don't know definitively uh, what the origins of the virus was, but if we think about patterns, what we've seen with other coronaviruses, SARS and MERS specifically, these are viruses that emerge from an animal host that jumped over into us. In the case of SARS, we know that a bat infected civet cats and civet cats ultimately caused the virus to jump into people. And in the case of MERS, we understand that uh, camels, dromedary, uh, single hump camels, are the primary reservoir for infecting people. So we understand that nature is the dominant route by which we've seen emergent diseases over the years and specifically in terms of coronaviruses. There is nothing to suggest um, any uh, laboratory release uh, for this virus. It was, it's been raised as a potential, and it is a potential. We know that laboratories do have a, a potential role for um, accidental release of any number of microbes, but there's been nothing to really indicate that besides just saying it's a possibility. We have lots of examples of how coronaviruses have come out of mother nature. So I think Peter's observation that uh, in some way wildlife trade, and, and in this case, wildlife farming may be um, the primary route by which this virus emerged, uh, to me, makes sense. It's unfortunate, however, that the study, the WHO study, was not able to follow that observation um, on the ground. And there were ways, there are ways you can do it um, to be able to follow what's called the value chain, the, how these movements would have, how these animals would have moved from southern China up into Wuhan. You can backtrack and look for telltale signatures of the movement of this virus among those animals. Uh, that opportunity did not arise. So I think Peter's observation historically makes sense. We've seen this pattern um, over and over and over again. Mother Nature is much more complicit in these spillover events. Uh, and we don't have to invoke laboratories in order to explain them. But we also need to understand that laboratories do have a potential role and we need to do due diligence in making sure we have labs that are doing proper biosecurity and management of these um, different microbes altogether. So as I said, the uh, the report left more questions than answers. Um, even as Peter provided that answer, that in turn raised five more questions in terms of trying to validate that answer. Um, so I, I would support Peter in his conclusion, at least as a conclusion that needs to be further investigated. And I think it's the most likely um, route by which COVID-19 emerged. Stella? Yeah, thank you. Um, James, uh, you, you did have a question for Robert and Amy as well, didn't you? Yeah, I'm just wondering if they could, you know, so given this not quite conclusive evidence, but uh, given this indication that this was a likely uh, route for a spillover, uh, what does it mean for journalists what does it indicate uh, we should be uh, focusing our coverage on in order to better help the public to understand the origins of zoonotic diseases and how we can prevent them? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, Dennis, thank you for that. I think in terms of the origins of this virus, one of the things that I think is important to lay out is Here's what we do know and here's what we don't know. What we do know is that there is a massive diversity of coronaviruses in bat populations in southern China and also neighboring regions, potentially Myanmar, Laos, etc. 
Um, we know that there are animals that are capable of transmitting coronavirus that were raised in Southern China, um, in the Yunnan province that were sold for consumption at that Huanan seafood market. And pardon my pronunciation, all of our uh, Chinese staffers are constantly making fun of my Mandarin pronunciations. Um, but we do know that animals were sold for consumption that can carry coronaviruses that were from regions of China where we know there to be a massive diversity of coronaviruses. Um, like Dennis mentioned, there is no evidence that suggests that this virus comes from a lab. We've not seen one single piece of evidence to suggest that that was the case really at all. And, and I'm reminded constantly these days of something I learned when I was in journalism school, which is that you know one of the most important roles that journalists have to play is deciding what people know. But conversely, and I would say almost more important, another role of a journalist is deciding what not to repeat, what is not worth repeating. Um, and I think a lot about, you know, the, the only real quote evidence we have of a laboratory lease is, is US government officials who have said that they think that is the case. Um, the media reported that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction for years based on the US government officials saying they think that that is the case. That turned out to not be true and in fact was a lie that US government was perpetrating on purpose. Um, and so that's piece of advice A, I would say, is, is where is evidence and where is there not evidence? And that has to be what, what dictates not only coverage, but sort of prevailing theory. We have to have to follow evidence. To Dennis's point, the, the process of science is often a little bit slow. Um, and frequently, you know, you'll see papers that end with more study needed. And that is frustrating when it comes to journalistic process. Often, study A gives you results X that have to be expanded on in study B. Um, and I think that sort of tends to butt up against the nature of the media landscape, which seeks to provide digestible answers for, for obvious reasons to an audience. And, um, but that's kind of the process that we have to go through is we find potential thing and then we further study that thing, which finds another thing. And that's kind of the process that these things go through. Um, but in terms of, you know, communicating disease, risk, et cetera, again, what Dennis has said is, is was really, really important there, which is that like, this is not a black swan event. And I think one of the major gaps I've seen in coverage is that treatment that this is Whew, this was our once in a century and we can rest easy for another hundred years, but that's not the case. We're seeing between two and five new viruses spill into human populations every year. Um, I have a little list here that I pulled up just sort of as an experiment. Um, but in, the, in 2020 alone, outbreaks of obviously COVID-19 were reported. There was an outbreak of MERS in the UAE. There was an outbreak of Ebola in the DRC measles in Palestine. We have um, measles in the Central African Republic, another Ebola outbreak in the DRC, uh, MERS in Qatar, yellow fever in South Sudan, yellow fever in Ethiopia, dengue in France, measles in Mexico, measles in Burundi. We are seeing outbreaks at insane rates. And so to treat COVID-19 like it's some once in a generation problem that we can sort of rest easy about later really does miss the, quite literally miss the forest for the trees. Um, and I think that's important to note is that this is a problem that we're seeing in an increasing way. Obviously other problems play into this as well. Climate change is going to remain an issue as climates become warmer, uh, the, the regionality of certain vectors that carry disease, things like malaria, dengue, et cetera, are going to change and expand. We're not that far from seeing climates in the United States, for instance, that could sustain mosquito populations that could carry things like malaria. Another issue of climate changes that we're going to see within the next 50, 100 years, millions of climate refugees. And, and in all likelihood, 
the places where people who have had to escape uh, places that are no longer livable due to climate change are going to be housed very, very close together, likely without a lot of proper sanitation, the sorts of things that do prevent disease spread. And so climate change presents also a massive disease risk, not only because of its threat, but also the way that we're as humans going to have to adapt to climate change is also going to create problems. And so we are seeing a world in which this is going to be an ever present problem, unless to Dennis point, unless we invest some money up front in, in the prevention of these problems. We treat infectious disease for whatever reason as something that is to be responded to. But, you know, 100, 200 years ago, it was a pretty edgy idea to enact things like lifestyle choices, exercise, diet, what have you, to prevent things like heart disease, cancers, et cetera. That is all very commonplace now. And I think I see no reason why we shouldn't treat infectious disease similarly, which is something that we must upfront invest in measures to prevent so that it doesn't ever become an issue in the first place. On top of that, we also need to be prepared. It is going, spillover is always going to happen, but if we're investing properly in prevention, we'll see less. And if we're investing properly in preparedness, we'll be ready to respond more quickly when those outbreaks do start. Um, thank you, Robert. We are now, uh, time is running fast. Uh, so, but I think we can go a little over, you know, our, the you know, our one hour that we had aimed for. And uh, James, uh, if you can uh, ask once more the question to Amy, and then I have, we, we do have some questions. I'm not sure if we can cover them all, but I have a question, you know, for Dennis um, before I think we can wrap it up today. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be quick. Just Amy, maybe, I know you've led a lot of coverage of wildlife trade and even in relation to uh, zoonotic diseases, maybe you have some thoughts on what journalists out there can be covering in that regard. Yeah, thank you, James. And um, yeah, I, uh, I just want to build on what Dennis and Robert have uh, pointed out, um, that this is not a black swan event. This is, you know, we are here for the, for the long haul. And I think journalists also need to take that approach to, to look at this as a, as a long-term problem, a recurring problem. It's, it's you know, um, we need to be ready as well. The journalist needs to, to you know, um, have all the knowledge um, there and the connections uh, to report on, on, on this issue. And, um, you know, following the, 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 the chain, the supply chain, I think it's a very good approach. Um, and to do that, I think we need a more collaborative approach. And um, increasingly at, at Earth Journalism Network, we are encouraging journalists across the borders to work together. Um, you know, we, we know that uh, wildlife trade comes from uh, different parts of Southeast Asia to, to China, to Vietnam, and uh, more and more there are also wildlife coming from Africa, um, you know, across um, the ocean to, to Asia. So um, there's even movement from America um, down to, to, to Asia as well and vice versa. So, uh, you know, journalists really need to be, um, working together and forming these networks across countries, um, help each other to gather data because, um, you know, journalists from one country may not be able to uh, get data in another country because it's, it's, it's too dangerous um, or there might be language barriers. Um, so, you know, other journalists should, um, you know, could, could with, with that access, could, could come in and help. So um, we, you know, I, I really think, um, you know, journalists uh, need to, to start uh, sharing um, and doing more collaborative reporting. And also not just, um, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of interest in the WHO report and where does that lead us? Um, there's a lot of interest in uh, the farms in the South. Um, and as you can imagine, the security is really tight at the moment. Um, we've got journalists who are We've got one journalist who's trying to get there, and 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 it's just been dissuaded from from going there because it's just too dangerous for him to do that. So, um, but you know, there are a lot of angles that you can look at this uh, story. Um, you know, especially in terms of of the different um, 
factors, different contributing factors to the emergence of zoonotic diseases and, um, you know, may not be the, the most sexy story uh, of, of the day, but they are really important um, topics to look into. And there are lots of stories in there uh, for journalists to discover. I totally agree with you, Amy. Uh, a few years ago, we saw an outbreak of Nepal virus in, in southern part of India, but that was hardly ever reported by, by, by journalists from, from other regions, uh, because simply because you know, we didn't have this concept of collaborative journalism back then. Um, and, and we do have now some, some very uh, great platforms or organizations like EGN, for example, actively encouraging uh, this collaboration. Um, my, we, we do have a very interesting question, uh, Dennis here, and I would like to simply supplement that uh, by asking a question on my own. So the question we received is, when all the issues are so interlinked, you know, how could journalists, uh, let me read it, how, what, what strategies can journalists adopt to come up with hard hitting pieces and the questions that I uh, want to ask you, uh, both Robert and you, Dennis, you have talked about the tremendous politicization that we have seen in the, you know, when the pandemic just started. Uh, my, as a journalist, my question is, how can anybody do a hard hitting piece on zoonotic diseases, uh, especially when there is no conclusive evidence on any finding uh, or, or, or the reports are not giving drawing any any conclusion. How can anyone do a heart hitting case that will not invoke racial bias? Something that, besides politicization, has also been you know we have seen a lot of that. So how can we report this issue that will not then you know snowball into into very negative uh, reactions like? Uh, or, you know, the, the human rights violation, for example, racial bias, or lead to more politicization? Well, it's, it's a really um, excellent question. Look, first and foremost, um, while we don't have definitive answers for, let's say, a lot of the um, backstory for, uh, for COVID-19, uh, the truth is we have a lot of information that allows us to think fairly clearly um, about where the virus came from. And we need to build on knowledge. We need to build on information, facts. And even though you know, there isn't conclusive evidence, let's also be very clear that the only reason that the discussion about a laboratory release of this virus is even still being talked about today is because of the politicalization of COVID-19. In some sense, COVID-19 was weaponized by um, a particular political um, leader who, for his own benefit, it had nothing to do with the virus. It had more to do with his own political future. And I think journalists need to differentiate between why someone is saying something. Is it based on fact? or is it based on some short-sighted political agenda? And I think the uh, discussion around laboratories, which again, I believe we need to be thoughtful about laboratories, but the disproportionate weight of the laboratory origin really goes back to weaponizing COVID-19 as part of a political debate uh, between uh, political leaders. So I think journalists need to be careful about giving equal value to equal, you know, to different arguments. Um, as Robert has pointed out that COVID-19 is part of a very long tradition within coronaviruses. We find them in nature, we find them spilling over from nature into us. We see it repeatedly over and over and over again. So, you know, the, the weight of history in this case, the weight of biology is on the side of a natural emergence. 
So it's, I think journalism first and foremost needs to um, think carefully about giving equal voice when the voices that are being expressed, one side is for political agenda, another side has to do with science and evidence. Um, so I think, you know, the, ultimately it comes back to give weight to where we have evidence, be very careful about overvaluing political, politically driven opinions. Mother Nature doesn't respond to politics one way or the other. We're the ones who pay attention to it. And if I could jump on that, Stella, to your point about um, either biases or sort of, um, you know, the rise in AAPI hate that we've seen as, as partially as a result of COVID-19. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is important, and I always try and point out to journalists when I'm speaking with them, is the, the ways in which Western demand dictates a lot of these behaviors that, that increase the potential of spillover of disease. Palm oil is a big industry in Malaysia and is leading to a lot of deforestation in Malaysia. Those oil palm plantations aren't being put up for the benefit of Malaysian citizens. That Palm oil is ending up in the toothpaste that I use here sitting in New York City, in the food that I'm eating in my pantry. Um, raccoon dogs are an animal that, are, that were frequently raised uh, in China on, on wildlife farms. And, and those were raised because the fur from a raccoon dog is used in the fur trim on the lining of jackets. Those are mostly sold in stores in Europe and, and North America. Um, I think that's a that's an important point and distinction is that while a lot of the risk is in areas like Africa, like South and Southeast Asia, a lot of the reason risk exists is because of Western demand. Like I mentioned earlier, extractive industries, a large amount of the extractive industry right now in Africa is the mining of rare earth minerals. Those rare earth minerals are used in phones, in laptops, in the sorts of products that are purchased by and large by people who look a lot more like me um, than the native populations of the places where they come from. And I think that's an important distinction to make. And I think that in and of itself is, so to your point, a hard hitting story to be written is that, again, people who look a lot like me are causing a lot of problems for people who don't look like me. And, and we should be taken to task for that. Frankly, um, another thing, and, and Dennis is too humble to mention it, but when you want to talk about story ideas, the Global Virome Project is is some is one of the things that I think is if you're looking to talk about okay, COVID nineteen happened, how the hell do we move on from here? Um, Dennis, you'd be better than me, but if you could tell us a little bit about the global the Global Virome Project, I think that's a brilliant idea and a perfect example of the type of of work that is. Um, forward thinking and considering the problems and really looking to creating a better future when it comes to the threat of diseases. Dennis? Dennis, you're muted, sorry. Yeah. I put you on the spot and then you were muted, that's my fault. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Look, um, you know, there's an old saying that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, and expect a different result is the definition of madness. And if you look at how we have responded to COVID-19, how we've responded to uh, MERS, how we responded to avian influenza, how we responded to SARS, it, it's a very similar pattern. That is, we largely wait for an event to begin circulating. We wait for an outbreak, something that tells us that there is a threat circulating in a human population. And then we begin to react. But what we've seen over and over again is by the time we begin to react, these viruses have moved far more quickly and over a much larger geographic area than our ability to control them. Waiting for a outbreak or an epidemic or a pandemic to begin before we start acting 
is a recipe for failure. And we keep doing it over and over again, expecting to get a different result. And in this case, COVID-19 is, is the poster child for why waiting for a pandemic to begin before we start acting is a recipe for absolute failure. I've mentioned earlier that all of these viruses, every future virus we're going to be threatened by already exists. It's circulating in bats. Uh, it may be in China, it may be in Southeast Asia, it may be in Africa, it may be in Amazonia, it may be in the United States. You know, it, it's there. And the fact that we know it's there and we have the technologies and the ability to go out and begin documenting and understanding those future risks and we don't do it is just extraordinary. And so the Global Virome Project is really about moving from a reactive to a proactive, not waiting for the virus to come to us, but we go to the virus in its natural habitat and begin documenting, documenting, un understanding what's there, which of the viruses really potentially pose a risk. We can understand looking at their genetic profile, understanding how they are distributed across wildlife, which of these viruses potentially pose a threat to us? And we can do what we do best. We can put them on a watch list and we can monitor them, track them, and use that information, knowing where they are geographically in the world, knowing what animals they are, circulating it, but most importantly, also understanding the interactive dynamics between those animals that are circulating in and people. You know, viruses don't jump to us. We go to the virus, we go to the animals and create an opportunity. Robert's point, it's about how our behaviors are driving the opportunity for these viruses to move from their natural habitats and reservoirs into us. The more we understand about these viruses, the more we can better prevent them. There's no reason there should ever be a spillover. A spillover is a direct consequence of our behaviors. What we need to do is to begin modulating, modifying, taking responsibility for the behaviors. You know, journalists can point out what it is that we're doing that create risk, but they can also point out how that risk can be ultimately mitigated. Robert made the, pointed out a, a brilliant example of the Nipah virus, an extraordinarily deadly virus, which is the virus that, Stella, you talked about showing up in Kerala um, state uh, several years ago in India. In Malaysia, they gave us the way forward. They really laid out the way forward, not only in terms of understanding why this virus jumped from a bat into pigs, and then the pigs into people, when that happened, the Malaysian government established strict regulations that required that pig farms essentially be isolated from potential exposure to bats, that they had to be raised in enclosed settings. And when they took those steps and essentially reduced and eliminated the opportunity for a bat to actually have any interaction with a um, a pig, or for the discarded food that a bat may have left to be end up being fed. They prohibited that, stopped it, and there hasn't been a single NEPA outbreak in Malaysia since then. It's a direct consequence of government stepping in, understanding where the risk was, and then requiring that the industries that were responsible for elevating that risk change their practices, bring in new practices. And right now, Malaysia hasn't had in 20 years an outbreak of Nipah, as opposed to Bangladesh has an outbreak of Nipah every um, February, March for different reasons. And we've seen now in Kerala, they have vulnerabilities to Nipah. So ultimately, if we take advantage of our understanding about the viruses in their natural habitat, we can take steps to prevent these 
spillover events prevent epidemics, prevent pandemics, but it requires that we begin thinking and acting differently. We don't wait for the virus to come to us and then act. We go to the virus and use that forward-leaning insight to create a world that's far safer than the world we're living in today. Tomorrow, we could have another spillover event and we won't know about it until it's circulating in a population somewhere in the world and then it's a race against how fast this virus can spread. We don't have the systems in place today that can prevent the next pandemic, but we can do it. We know what needs to be done. These lessons are clear uh, and we know exactly what needs to be done. And so the Global Virome Project is one of those critical steps to moving us from being reactive to proactive, from being at risk to being safe. I'll stop there. Thank you, Dennis. That was brilliant. Um, so the few key words that I picked up was understanding is the key and identifying the risk, taking timely action in, in, in a global, globally coordinated way. And as for journalists, um, Bill, how do you do you know, uh, hard hitting stories? Well, built on equal voice, science, evidence, and facts. And uh, we now you have some resources that have been shared here. There's Echo Health Alliance. You can follow Global Byron Project and their work. And of course, the, the online course that Amy just uh, introduced you to. Please do take the course and, um, and, and build your build better, you know, uh, when it comes to stories. So for better reporting, we will uh, encourage you to enroll and uh, take the course. Uh, and with that, um, I would uh, now thank each of our panelists uh, for their time and, and sharing all the knowledge and this, this tips and the take uh, away messages. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm pretty sure we will have a lot of great reporting coming out of, uh, you know, done by journalists who were here today, and probably they would be sharing what they learned here with their colleagues as well. So uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Amy, James. Thanks, everyone who attended uh, here today. And thank you, everybody who posted questions today. I hope your questions were answered. If you have more questions, you can always send to us, uh, to Earth Journalism Network. You can, you can follow us on social media, Twitter, and uh, uh, I will see you in the next webinar uh, because you know we will let you know what it is about. And yeah, we hope that whatever we learned from here today will be super helpful to you. So with that, thank you again. And uh, yeah, have a good evening and good morning, good afternoon and good night. Great, thank you all very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks everybody.